Good morning, everyone. Let's try to start, start on time here so we can stay on time. How many of you guys do hair restoration? One? Okay. So for the first part of the, the talk, it's going to be geared toward the beginner, and the last part will be geared toward the beginner and the advanced. So if you're bored for the advanced for the beginning, it will become a little bit, I think, hopefully better in some pearls and things that I've been doing that, that have been helpful. But it'll also still be good for the beginner. I want to really start with understanding hair loss. You can't start understanding hair restoration without understanding hair loss. That is a fundamental beginning. And it is a speeding train that you can't stop. You will continue to lose hair over your lifetime. And a lot of times when we look at hair loss, we think, okay, this person has a certain degree of hair loss. What are we going to do for them? But we don't think about what the consequences of our actions will be many years down the road. And I think that's just as important. So this little graphic helps me communicate with patients, which is a fact that over time we lose supply. In other words, this area back here where we take, there's less and less to be had. But over time, we increase demand. We need more and more and more hair because there's more and more loss. So this is not a good situation. And it's something that we have to think about. Let's say someone 25 years old comes to us with advanced pattern loss, and we say, oh, we can transplant and make him look good. What is he going to look like at 35, 45, 55, 65, 75? Are you going to leave him with this weird looking pattern that doesn't exist in a natural human being? No matter how beautiful your work is, will it age well for you? And I was sitting at a meeting in San Diego next to a colleague of mine. And he said, I can spell a sp spot a bad transplant from a mile away. I said, yeah, but can you spot all of them? And he goes, yeah. I said, the guy in front of you has a hair transplant, and the guy next to you has a, has a hair piece. He goes, there's no way. I said, look, I know the patterns. Your eye takes years to develop. Malcolm Gladwell, in his book, Outlier, says it takes 10,000 hours for you to become a master. And so what you take for granted is just drawing a hairline, putting some graphs up there, but you've got to see if it looks natural. And it's not just what you think. It is much more complicated than that. And, you, and over time, you'll begin to see. So we start with the Norwood pattern. Why put this stupid textbook photograph up here? The reason for it is that if you don't understand patterns of loss, you'll just draw a line up there and stick hair up there, and you'll say, well, my line looks natural. We'll talk about what defines a natural hairline in a moment. But wait a second. Do they fit a natural pattern loss? If you say, I don't know what that is, go look at everyone. Look at a Norwood 1, a 2, a 3. Ask yourself, is that person a 2, a 3, a 4? And look at how the temples fall. And look at the whole picture. Then go look at someone transplanted and see if you can spot if it looks natural. And I can guarantee if you're just starting out, you won't be able to. It takes years to see but you need to start on your journey and work with someone experienced to help train that thinking. Another easy graphic. Male pattern baldness is not that you wake up one day and you don't have hair. Your hair goes from thick terminal hairs to thin vellus hairs to zero. And that transitional phase is not only important understanding it from a surgical perspective, but a medical one. Because a medical trans, excuse me, a medical management with finasteride and minoxidil takes this and brings some of them back to here. It takes some of these and slows down the process to here. And it takes some of these and slows the process to here. But once it becomes this, it's not moving back. That's why medical management, which we'll talk about in a moment, is so important early on before the person becomes advanced. Once they're completely bald, the medicine's not going to rescue anything. Okay. So donor dominance, let's start from a really easy concept. Donor dominance means that hair taken from the back of the head and moved to the front will behave like the hair from the back of the head. It's genetically programmed to stay there. That's a good thing because it's permanent and it's a bad thing because you can have this tuft of a, a low hairline and nothing behind it and low drop temples that can look very weird over time. So you have to be cognizant or thoughtful of future hair loss. Stop. This is just a warning. I always try to make sure that everyone's ethical, artistic, and technical. 
You have to be careful. And it also introduces me to the next section, which is female hair loss. And I would highly recommend for you not to start with this. Start with men, because women, the design is very different, the expectations are very different. And what I have up here is to understand, you just can't say, oh, here's a woman losing hair, let's put hair up there. You gotta make sure she doesn't have medical reasons for hair loss. If it's a young 15-year-old girl that's just starting her periods, you have to ask if she's had, had a lot of heavy periods because that can lead to hair loss. If it's a woman 55 years old, she may have a frontal temporal loss, it could be hormone imbalance. If you see a woman that's overweight, it could be thyroid conditions, but it could be any of those. Or it could be something really weird, like a, what's called a scarring alopecia, or a dermatologic condition, which is a contraindication to surgery. If you operate on a scarring alopecia, your grafts may not take, then you get a really scary bad result and a very unhappy patient and wasted donor hair. For women, you're really looking at two indications, hair loss and hairline lowering. Hairline lowering is just a woman born with a hair, high hairline that looks masculine. And that's a more complicated uh, topic of discussion. And then hair loss, how do we have hair loss in women? There are different patterns. There's a Ludwig pattern, which is global circular loss. There is a Christmas tree pattern where you get this pattern that looks like this with the loss in the front with or without sparing the hairline. This actually, according to Lise Olson, is the most common kind. If you don't look for it, all you gotta do is slightly wet the hair and comb the hair in the center and have them look down. You'll see that pattern. So we'll, the, the, I'm not gonna get into uh, female pattern designing, but in, this, in essence, if you ask them where they part, you can either do a T design where you're putting the graphs here, or you do an, a, an L design of the part is over here, or a reverse L design of the part is there. Because when you're transplanting, the thing that you want to understand with numbers is you're born with about 100,000 hairs on your head. When you begin to see visible hair loss, you've lost 50,000, half of that. With each transplant, on average, you move about three to 5,000 hairs. Three to 5,000 hairs doesn't equal 50. It's not a one-to-one. -one. So you cannot replace it equally. So that's why artistry is so important. You have to be an artist. I talked about that two days ago with fat grafting. You have to be an artist. You have to allocate those grafts well and distribute them beautifully. We'll talk about what that means more in a moment. And then frontal temporal loss, which is male pattern loss due to androgens over time. Medicine, so this is a very broad overview. There's really only two FDA cleared medicines in the United States. You guys in other countries may have different ones, but it's minoxidil and finasteride or Rogaine and Propecia. So let's talk about each one of them. This comes in five and 2%, 5% for men, 2% for women. Oftentimes I use the 5% in, in women as well because I can accelerate that stability, and I'll talk about what that means in a moment, of, of hair loss and bring them faster to where, where they need to be. Studies have shown that after about a year, they're about the same in terms of benefit for women. In other words, after about a year of use of five or 2%, they both work about as well. But of course, with 5%, you have a risk of secondary hair growth. That secondary hair growth is not because they actually touch their face. It's a mistaken idea. It's because it, it absorbs in the bloodstream and they, get, they can get secondary hair growth. They can even get it with a 2%. The, how, how, how do you apply this? You don't apply it to the hair, you apply it to the scalp. And what you want to do is apply actually more than what's recommended on the package insert. Because the package inserts is only indicated for the crown. It, it works well everywhere, equally well. And the reason is the FDA studies in the late 90s only looked at the crown, but it works well e everywhere. So I put it all over, maybe th two to three or four times a dose. And people always say, well, I can't do it twice a day. That's okay. If they can do it once a day, it's great. If they can do it once a, every other day, they can do great. If they can do it three times a week, it's great. Whatever you can comply with, right? If you don't use it, it's not gonna work. And this takes about two to four months to really start seeing the effects. But you have to warn the patient that about a month into it, they could see a little bit further shedding. And that further shedding, all that's indicating is that the hairs are going into a growth phase called antigen. And it may not happen, but if it happens, tell the patient it's okay. Why use minoxidil? Does minoxidil work differently than finasteride? Yeah, they actually work through two different pathways. 
but they work synergistically. They've shown that the people that have been on minoxidil for many years and they add, rogue, or add finasteride, they get a better result. Those that have been on both medicines, they stop one, they lose some result. So it's like playing a piano with two hands. Together they work better than alone. Very important, you need to know that, okay? Why use this? Besides just slowing down hair loss, if you've got a lot of those vellus hairs, remember that, that drawing I showed you, terminal vellus zero? If you've got a lot of those wispy vellus hairs and you just go transplant them <coughs> without using some finasteride or some minoxidil over a few months before you start, those vellus hairs can shock loss out. Temporary devastating loss where they look much balder. So if I see someone with a lot of miniaturized vellus hairs, I will start them with a few months or a few weeks at least of minoxidil, usually six weeks or so, so that I can get them through a st stable phase and minimize shock loss. Does it prevent it? Does it eliminate it? No, but it can minimize it. And finasteride takes much longer for that stability on the order of three to six months, sometimes longer. But I like using both, but people that say, look, I don't really want to take long-term medicines, at least do the minoxidil. Um, and I have no financial affiliation with either company. The 5% the comes in a foam, which as of March 1st, no longer is on patent. So you can actually get this as a generic now. But it doesn't, I don't believe comes in 2%. I may be wrong, they may have just changed that. So the foam, why use the foam? Does it work better? No, it works the same. It has two benefits. It doesn't have propylene glycol, which is an allergic component, about 23% of people using it. And it also uh, is easier to apply. So people that are allergic to it, they need the foam, even women. So they take a little risk of the uh, you know, growth on the, on, the, on the beard area. So that is minoxidil in a nutshell. How does it work? It doesn't really matter. It's a potassium channel agonist, uh, vascular growth, things like that. We, d we don't need to get into it because it really doesn't matter. Uh, finasteride is, is a 5-alpha uh, reductase inhibitor, uh, blocking DHT to testosterone conversion. Who really cares? Just you need to know that. Um, but really this is at a one milligram dose. You don't need to use a five milligram. As of next year, this will also be off patent. So in, if people in the United States, it's gonna be a lot cheaper in a very short time. Uh, this is sold in three month pro packs. You don't need the, the five milligram dose, which is ProScar. It's too much, unless someone has a prostate issue. The big thing is you need to know is that it works well with Rogaine. It takes longer to stabilize the hairs and show regrowth, sometimes up to nine months to a year. Uh, it is something that, just like minoxidil, if you stop using it, you lose everything you gain. It doesn't accelerate your loss. So if you use it for five years and you would have been this bald, you would have st held this long, if you stop it, you'll go back to where you would have been without the medicine. Unfortunately, something you need to know. And when you're planning transplants, you gotta be really careful and conservative because you never know when someday someone may stop using it and then you're in trouble. The product really works well with, uh, with, uh, with minoxidil. I think the take home points is I can get really deep into finasteride is just the side effects. There are things on the internet today that says that it's permanent sexual side effects. I know that Merck has made some amendments to their, their comments that it could be uh, permanent. I've seen one patient from England that had this out of thousands of prescriptions, but it's about 1.5% higher against placebo, so very low, about 3% chance of sexual side effects, decreased sperm count, you cannot, uh, sorry, decreased libido as well. You cannot uh, give this to someone who's gonna donate blood because you, a female that's in the childbearing age can have a birth defect in a male fetus in the genitalia. Men having it will not transmit birth defects onto children if they impregnate a woman. So these are just some side effects you need to know about. It does drop your PSA score by about half. It is processed through your liver, uh, liver function test. You have to check. Um, this is something that I actually have them sign a, a long consent form that Bob Bernstein wrote, to, wrote just so that, so now we live in a litigious society and I just have people are cognizant of those things. The, the mo more recent side effects people have said is it can actually increase risk of breast cancer, something you need to know, but very unlikely, very unlikely. And also mood disorders is a new thing people are talking about. You just need to know the side effects and counsel a patient is a physician. Um, it is something that is very equivocal. That means, you know, plus or minus on women in the postmenopausal period. I don't prescribe it anymore in women after 
their menopause because usually it's not a DHT based issue. So it's not very effective in women. There was only one study in 2006 by Iorezzo that showed any benefit, but it was an uncontrolled study. Controlled studies have not shown benefit in women, but again, just to emphasize, you can't do this in childbearing women. I know that's a lot to remember, but remember one more thing is that we forget ab about other ancillary techniques to help, which is uh, topic or nanogen camouflaging products that can really help minimize thinning. You can put this on your scalp and really minimize the, the, the thinness, either when they have shock loss after a transplant or just a, as, a, as an alternative to hair restoration or as, a, as an addition to hair restoration. So something to consider. And nan I don't have any financial affiliation. Nanogen is a product that is helpful because it, it, is, it, is, it could, it may not uh, create uh, loss when you're in the pool, like when you're, because it, there's supposedly a locking mechanism, it's a, a UK brand. I'm not too certain if uh, it does better than Topic, but anyways, I'll leave it at, at, at that. Let's go through how I do this procedure now. 